Math is an important part of programming, not necessarily C-sharp programming, but programming in general. It really doesn't matter what language you're using or what application you're writing, but somewhere, somehow, mathematical calculations are going to come into play. Now, those calculations could be something very simple, or they could be something very complex. Uh, I know in my daily writing, I do have to generate some PDFs or work with graphics, or sometimes generate a report that gets sent to the printer, and those are calculation heavy. But, you know, unless if you're doing something like that, it, the amount of math that you have to do is, is rather light. So, um, I do know that some of today's lesson is going to be um, boring, for the lack of a better word, but please don't write this lesson off. Uh, yes, we are going to be covering math, but there are a couple of other topics. One is comments, which are really easy, and but the most important is going to be memory management because the .NET framework handles memory differently for different types of data. We're going to talk about value types today and there's another type of value called reference types which we will uh, talk about whenever we start writing our own classes. So let's get started today with just some simple math and really we're just going to blow through this because math in C Sharp is very close to the math that we learned in school. So let's start. I'm going to create a variable. It's going to be an integer and it is going to have a value of 2 plus 4. And what actually happens here when this code executes, foo, the, the variable foo, is given a value of 6, you know, because naturally the, uh, the application is going to take 2 plus 4 and take that result, which is 6, and assign that to foo. Now, if you'll notice, I typed two slashes and then a space and a 6 after. Now, the space is optional, but this is what is called a single line comment. Comments are just for our use or somebody else that is reading our code. They are completely ignored by the compiler. So we can just, you know, type all day long of, of gibberish, and it's really not going to matter because it's all going to be ignored. So it, it's you know, really helpful, especially if you are writing some code that is difficult to follow. And I can speak from firsthand experience that I'll write something and then six months to a year later I have to go back and look at that code and I'm wondering what did I write? Why did I do it this way? Well, that's why comments are here so that we can type something out to give some type of insight as to what type of voodoo that we are doing with our code. Now this is a single line comment so anything after the double slash is going to be considered a comment. But we do have a multi-line comment. Comment. And that has a slash followed by an asterisk. And then Visual Studio is automatically adding in those other asterisks as I press enter. But then to end a multi line comment, you do an asterisk and another slash. So it's kind of like an HTML tag, but <laughs> not really. At least that you have a beginning which is a slash asterisk, and then an end, which is an asterisk slash. And then anything within this little block of comments, and these asterisks really don't mean anything, but anything, anything in here is a comment, so it would be um, completely ignored by the compiler. Um, as to which one you use, it really doesn't matter. I've seen more... Uh, single line comments use the multi line. In fact, there is a keyboard shortcut. If you hold down Control K and then C with keeping control still held, it will comment that line that you're on. So if you have multiple lines, let's just add multiple lines, and if we select them all, we can you know quickly comment them all out and then if you want to uncomment them you press control K and then while still holding control down you press U so that's a, a nice little nifty feature of Visual Studio okay so getting back to our math here on the right hand side of the equal sign that would be called an expression we have uh, in this case a mathematical expression 2 plus 4 and it is 
primarily executed from left to right. So it takes two and then it adds four to it. So if we add another addition operation here, it's the same thing. It's going to take two plus four, which is six, and then it's going to add one, which is seven. So that changes to seven. And then just to finish this off, uh, let's add three. So we'll have two plus four is six plus one is seven plus three is 10. So it goes from left to right. And the order of operation is the same for subtraction as well. If you remember from math, you, there was the, um, uh, the mnemonic for, you know, the order of operations, you know, multiplication, division, subtract, or addition and subtraction. Well, th that applies here as well. Um, the multiplication and division are on their own level of precedence, which is the, the technical term. And then, um, addition and subtraction are on their on a lower level of precedence, but they are on their same precedence. So we haven't really changed anything as far as what gets evaluated before the others. So it's still two plus four, which is six, but now it's doing the minus one, which is five, and then plus three, which is eight. But if we change one of these, uh, let's change that to multiplication. In C sharp, the multiplication operator is an asterisk. It's not an X because, you know, X is an alphabetic character, which is typically some type of identifier, either for a, um, a variable or for a method. So it's an asterisk for multiplication. And now the order of operation has changed because, you know, multiplication comes before addition. So now it takes four times one, which is four, and then it does all the other addition operations. Now we can change the order of operation by using parentheses, just like in math. So in this case, it would be two plus four, which is six times one, which is six plus three, which is nine. And of course we could also do that, which then it would do the expression inside of the parentheses first, but it would do four times one since that is multiplication, which is four plus two, six plus three is nine. So, I mean, really, I, that's really it. As far as math is concerned, let's just do division. It's, a slash and that's it um, you know it's just like the math that you learned in school okay so math and comments are done and out of the way as I said at the beginning those are going to be really easy so now let's talk about value types and a little bit about memory management uh, not necessarily memory management but how these values are stored in memory uh, yesterday, I said that there are two categories of data types, primitive and complex. Well, there's another set of categories. One is value types, and the other is reference types. And all of the primitive types that we talked about yesterday are value types. So integer, floating point, double floating point, decimal, uh, character, and Boolean, all of those are value types. And there's even more value types but I'm not going to go over those now. I'll just point them out whenever we work with them in later lessons. So why is the term value type value type? Well, it's because of how it is stored in memory. The actual value is stored in memory. So we have a variable called foo. And remember, variables are just boxes of memory. So we have foo equals 10. So the foo variable contains the value of 10. I know that that seems like I'm being kept in obvious, but it's very important because reference types are stored completely different. Okay, so value types are stored by their value, but they are also immutable, and that means that they cannot change. So 10 is assigned to foo, that 10 can never change. And to illustrate that, let's do int bar equals foo plus one. So what we have here, and, and I know once again that this seems obvious, but foo is not changed at all in this new line of code in line 13. Let's look at the expression, the right-hand portion of, or the right-hand portion after the equal sign. We have foo plus one. Well, we're not actually using the direct value of foo here. A copy of that value is made. So a copy of 10 is made and used in place of foo. So it's a copy of 10 plus 1, which, of course, is 11. 
But it's obvious as to what happens, you know, the, the result at least. But the copying issue isn't. And the copying is being done because it's immutable and it's being done behind the scenes so you don't even have to worry about it. Now, I said that these values are immutable and they cannot change. But you can change the value that a variable contains. So, for example, we have foo equals foo plus one. Now the same thing is happening here. On the expression side, foo is being used, but in actuality a copy of that value is being used. So a copy of 10 plus 1 is 11. So foo, after this line executes, is going to contain the value of 11. And in order to do that, the original value of 10 had to be destroyed. So it was completely removed out of memory, and then it was replaced with a new value of 10. So even though we use it in our expression, that didn't change the value of foo until the actual assignment was done. So I know that it seems rather obvious that, yes, we are working with the actual values here. But whenever we talk about reference types, and, and we're not going to do that today, but later on, whenever we talk about reference types, that is definitely not going to be the case. Uh, because they are stored completely different in memory, and they have to be handled differently as we write our code for them.